Hey everybody, I'm Nor'easter Nick Pittman, President and CEO of Norcast Media Group, and I want to welcome you to our annual Winter Outlook. So excited! I know there's a lot of weather weenies out there, such as myself, that cannot wait until the first flake flies. Now, I think it's important to be open and transparent and honest with you. We're not going to get this 100%. If we did, we would close down the company and retire because we would probably win the lottery every week, right? We do this for educational purposes. We do this for fun, and it is tradition. And I hope you learn a little bit of the why behind the what. We have a dedicated team of meteorologists with over 100 years of experience all working behind the scenes to put this forecast together. So let's jump right into it. First and foremost, let's take a look at last winter. I live around the Philly metro area and it was cold. We had that Arctic connection uh, many times and it was cold throughout the mid-Atlantic down into the Carolinas, across the Ohio Valley, and then, of course, through the northern plain states. There really wasn't a whole lot of extended warmth as the polar vortex was able to invade the lower 48 a couple times. In the snow department, the lakes got crushed, right? That is typically the case because of that warm temperature profile of the water versus the Arctic intrusions coming through that is uh, allowed to create more unstable conditions and allow for that snow. We were shocked to see that folks in the Carolinas and Alabama, Mississippi, Louisiana got more snow in some cases than the Philly metro area. And that was very disappointing. I just waved as the snow missed me down to the south. Of course, you go into the mountainous terrain and there's gonna be over 100 inches of, of snow there. It's very easy to produce the snow, but Last year was an anomaly. You don't see that a whole lot, especially when the running 30-year trend is to bring less snow in those snowy areas. So around Chicago, down into the Ohio Valley, we're actually trending upwards in the snow production department throughout the Northeast, even though we didn't see it last year. That 30-year average, which I think is kind of skewed a little bit because of 2009, 2010, then that very next year, uh, major coastal storms, blockbuster nor'easters. We didn't really have that last year. We did have a couple larger storms, but uh, those classic nor'easters that form deep in the Gulf and right up the coast, haven't really seen one of those in, in a while. It's been several years. But this is something we are definitely watching as things change up uh, climatologically. So just be aware of that. Uh, Pacific Northwest trending in a snowier direction, but you go down into the Ozarks and uh, you know deep in the heart of Dixie and you overall see less of the white stuff. Now we are in a situation where there's uh, major droughts going on all across the country. Uh, Maine in an extreme drought. You go on the border of Ohio and Indiana, right around the Great Lakes. You have moderate drought conditions for the Mid-Atlantic, and it seems like some parts of the South are always under a drought. Look at this in Georgia, the Panhandle of Florida in an extreme drought, and then the Four Corners region all the way through the Rockies looking at well below normal precipitation. So we're gonna throw it over to our partner, Brian, to talk about the global patterns. Take it away, Brian. Thanks so much, Nick. Really appreciate it. That is a great intro into getting more into the meat and potatoes, talking about the overall setup with some of the atmospheric and oceanic type parameters heading into this winter season. One of the big things, of course, that we look at is the ocean, La Nina, El Nino. It is ENSO, El Nino Southern Oscillation. And when we see it in red, when we see it in orange here, not seeing that now, it is El Nino. We have a La Nina. It's not an extremely strong one, but definitely very noticeable. It will certainly have a big influence, especially for the first half of winter. The second half, it's probably gonna start fading away a decent amount. But generally when we have a La Nina, we will see frequent cold across portions of the Northwest into the plains and at times dipping into the Great Lakes. But the jet stream kind of sets up here. Now it's all about averages. So sometimes the jet stream goes up here. Sometimes it comes down here but when we average it all out, you typically see the warmer air further off towards the south. Now, once we get in towards the second half of winter, we get into more of a neutral state, and this goes out the window slightly at least, and that is what we consider Lanada or more of a neutral 
type of a situation. Now, the jet stream is pretty active. We're going to see these big belts over the next couple of weeks dip on down with some big ridging as well. Notice how kind of like north to south at times this gets where it's not just mild Pacific air west to east across the country. Look at that. Pretty strong jet stream coming on up round in the bend. This is going to yield storminess at times and is a sign of things to come. It's that early winter type pattern that is definitely settling on into the area. So one of the big things that we need to keep an eye on is this cool pool. We've had since about 2019 or so a general pattern of a negative PDO or Pacific Decadal Oscillation. And we have this area of troughing, a low pressure area that forms because of the colder air to the west of the Canadian coastline, south of Alaska. Now, right up against the coast, yes, warm sea surface temperatures. And notice here, very warm conditions further off towards the south. We'll keep a close eye on that in just a couple of graphics. But I wanted to show you the Atlantic Ocean, warm, Warm, warm. Look at all these reds and yellows and um, oranges here, especially into the North Atlantic. Look at this. This is very warm and that creates an area of high pressure, a blocking pattern. And in the atmosphere where you have a big ridge, typically next to it, you're going to have a big trough. So ridging here, troughing across portions of eastern Canada into the Great Lakes Midwest and in towards the Mid-Atlantic and Northeast as well. So with this type of dynamic, very important to kind of keep in mind that you can pull the air from northern Canada much better. Now, do we have the right setup where the coldest air is set up there? Sometimes yes, sometimes no, but you at least offer a much better opportunity to push cold air into portions of the central and eastern US. Now, if we have a negative phase of the eastern Pacific Oscillation, we're starting to put together a ton of parameters that would yield a very cold, widespread winter. But let's look to the Pacific. We had troughing here that we showed you on just a couple of maps, not so much in the way of a big area of high pressure and warmth here. It was more here, it was more here. So this type of pattern probably won't happen too often with the Eastern Pacific Oscillation being in the negative phase, at least deeply negative. But if it does, watch for some bouts of more widespread cold air. Now as we get ready to introduce our actual winter forecast maps, first we're going to take a look at some different model forecasts with Jeff. Take it away. Thank you very much, Brian. A great explanation for sure. One of the additional weather features besides the upper level pattern and the jet stream that we look at as forecasters is the atmospheric modeling, which is a computerized or digital simulation of what we're expecting the atmosphere to do over the course of days, weeks, and even months. Now, this particular weather image that you can see are various weather models, three different weather models to be exact, the Canadian model on the upper left, the European model on the upper right, and the American model in the lower center. Now, uh, these images represent what the model is expecting the overall temperature to do over the next three months, three and a half months from December, January, and February. Now, as you can see there, the Canadian model on the upper left and the American model in the bottom center does show some areas of blue indicating overall below normal temperatures through the winter. But the European model on the upper right shows a much different scenario where there's much more in the areas of yellow and even orange, which would indicate above normal temperatures expected for the next three and a half months. Now, these models have a tendency to be a little bit warmer than what actually happens. So the fact that two of those models are indicating below normal average temperatures temperatures for the winter across the Northern Plains, the Upper Great Lakes, and New England is a little bit of an indicator that there certainly could be pockets of very cold air, particularly across the Northern Plains, the Northern Great Lakes, and Northern New England for this upcoming winter. Now, the next image is the European Center model predicted snowfall amount for the next 
three and a half months through mid-March. Now, the areas of blue on the top of your screen indicates where this model is predicting snowfall amounts to be generally above normal. The areas of yellow and orange below normal. So as you can see there across Idaho, western Montana, and northwest Wyoming, as well as the northern plains, Minnesota, and just north of Michigan and Wisconsin up toward extreme northern New England and eastern Canada, this model is calling for snowfall amounts to generally be above normal. And further to the south, across much of the lower 48 states, the northeast, the northern mid-Atlantic, the mid-Atlantic, and particularly the Ohio and the Tennessee Valley, those areas, this model is showing where snowfall amounts are expected to be below normal. So again, the further north and west you live, across the upper Great Lakes, the northern plains, and New England, that shows where snowfall amounts could be well above normal, but we'll have to wait and see on that. Another very significant weather feature that we're going to have to keep in mind as we forecast the precipitation, the temperature, and the snowfall for this upcoming winter is the polar vortex. That's going to be a very important weather indicator. How that behaves is going to determine exactly where the cold and the warm air sets up and exactly where the rain and the snow sets up. And what better person to explain not only the polar vortex, but really the final amounts of what we're going to be seeing in terms of rainfall, temperature, and snowfall than our own Brittany Trumpy, who's going to explain all of this. Brittany, take it away. Thank you so much, Jeff. Yeah, we're going to take a look at a couple of analogs. What analogs are is basically we look at years that had a very similar pattern as what we're currently seeing, and we see how things kind of turned out during those years. We average them all together, and sometimes they're very useful to see what this year could possibly look at. They're not always 100% accurate, but it's a very good thought exercise, and sometimes it can show us a couple of trends that might not be as obvious. Looking at some of those temperatures, analogs, we are looking at some of that cooler air really focused on the central U.S. as well as the Pacific Northwest. Meanwhile, for the bulk of the East Coast, we are looking a little bit warmer. And basically what this means is that we're going to see a lot of back and forth between colder and warmer conditions. Whenever you have this uh, imbalance between two different sections of the United States, it can cause some big swings in temperatures, which could allow for a more active pattern, but also could spell uh, a little bit of some turmoil for some of those storms that want to set up. Uh, looking at our precip analogs, we are looking at a drier pattern overall for the eastern U.S. And when you put those two things together, drier plus warmer, it doesn't really spell uh, that much of an opportunity for that much winter weather. Now, that being said, things can change. You can have that coming together of perfect ingredients that do allow for some big winter systems. As far as what we're considering for our temperature outlook for 2025 and 2026, we have the potential for some stubborn cold air through the central U.S. and the Great Lakes extending back towards the Pacific Northwest. Meanwhile, for the bulk of the East Coast and for the Southwest, we are looking warmer. Now, of course, the Southwest typically is warm in comparison to those areas up to the north, but we're talking about warmer than average, which means that the opportunity for winter weather looks a little bit lower, not only in those areas, but also possibly for the east coast. Looking at that precip outlook, it's a very similar look. Again, a lot of moisture potentially for the central U.S., for the Great Lakes, a large portion of the northern Rockies, but things are looking a little bit drier for the east coast and for the southeast. Now, when we look at those two things kind of average together, that gives us our potential snowfall outlook for 2025 and 2026. Looks to be a bit of an active season with substantial snowfall above or much above average potential for snow for most of the central U.S. and the Great Lakes. Meanwhile, things look a little bit quieter down to the south and further off to the east. And that doesn't mean no snow at all for our folks shaded in orange. What it means is that we have to have a perfect scenario where we have the cold air in place and the precip moving through the same area at the same time. So it just means that for our folks that are looking a little bit drier or a little bit warmer, we just have to go almost by a storm by storm basis. Now, one thing that could really throw a wrench into our entire forecast is the polar vortex, which is a term that a lot of people have heard of, and it's a little bit of a buzzword, so to speak. But let's talk about specifically what it is. When we talk about the polar vortex, we're talking about that circulation around the North Pole, around that northern low. And basically what it does is it acts as a barrier 
almost a fence, helps to keep that cold air up to the north. Now, when the polar vortex is strong, we don't really see a lot of variation in that rotation. It's very zonal. It's very west to east. It's very strong, and it keeps that cold air up across northern Canada and up towards the North Pole itself. However, there are times where that rotation or that circulation weakens just a little bit and it allows for more variation in that overall flow. It becomes a little less zonal and it allows some of that cold air to push just a little bit further south and all of a sudden you'll have cooler than average air moving down towards the northeast, towards the central US or towards the west coast. Now it's not always this exact setup where you have cold air off to the west and cold air off to the east. Sometimes you have that cold air dropping down over the central US. Again, this whole thing circulates around the globe, but if we do have these quick little wobbles where some of that colder air can escape the poles and come down towards our air, or down towards our neck of the woods, we could be seeing a more snow potential kind of setup for areas that were trending warmer overall. The polar vortex can really throw a wrench into things and give us that cold air that we were previously lacking for potential snow development. Now we're gonna to toss it over to Nick and he'll give you guys a quick little rundown on the summary of everything and what we're looking at for the rest of this year. Well guys, and there you have it. All right, that is our overlook with our dedicated team of meteorologists that work around the clock to uh, look at this stuff and get that information out to all of you. So we are not looking at a repeat of last year, but opposite side of that same coin, we're also not looking at uh, an overflow of warmth across the lower 48. There will be large temperature swings as that pendulum goes back and forth. And as a result of that, we believe it will be more active with bigger storms. Will the big cities see the big storms and the snowfall and all that kind of stuff? Well, time will tell. It's all going to come down to where that jet stream ultimately decides to set up shop. I want to thank you so much for watching and connecting with us. You can follow us on all of our social media channels by typing in NORCAST. We will pop right up. Uh, you can download the NORCAST weather app. And if you are in the snow and ice removal industry, if you're a local municipality, we have a weather consulting company that you can get very hyper-local detailed forecast from to save you and your operation as much money as possible. Let's have a great winter together.